Next up in our class, guys, one of my favorite classes, the Artificer. Welcome to the Attic Dungeon. My name is Sam, and whether you want to build a robot army or make a machine gun, I'm here to help you with everything. As always, before we get started, I want to thank you for watching my stuff. Um, I just do this for fun, but I regularly get feedback from people on how to improve or uh, feedback from people who've really used my stuff to make their campaign or their character better. And that makes me really happy. So yay you, yay me, spread the word, blah, blah, blah. Let's go talk about the Artificer. Oh boy, let's talk about the Artificer. I've been looking forward to doing this guide, but I've also been a bit afraid of doing this guide. Why? I absolutely love the class. It is one of my top three favorite classes, especially thematically. I love it. Um, and it's a good class as well. It has a lot of options, but Again, the many options is why I dread the guide. It's a bit like the Warlock. You have a lot, a lot, a lot of customization options here thanks to your infusions, your subclasses, and your spells. And that gives me too much to talk about in the amount of time that I try to respect for my guides. Anyway, what is the role of an Artificer in a party? Um, anything. There, I said it. Artificers can be anything. I'm not claiming they'll be the best at anything, but they can be a frontliner, a blaster, a healer, a controller, maybe the explorer for sure. Maybe being the party face is a bit more of a challenge to them, but they can certainly do that if you build for it. But it is maybe their least favorite role is being the party face. But when it comes to combat, they can cover all roles. What will people expect in general? The Artificer is more of a supporting class. And surely if you look at the base spell list and their base abilities, yes, the Artificer has great potential for being a support class, but they also have the potential to be anything. Um, as an Artificer, what ability scores are you going to want? First off, Intelligence. Intelligence is going to be your spell casting ability score. And to be honest, um, so if you have four Artificer subclasses at this point, two are a bit more spell castery, two are a bit more get up in your face and punch you in the facey or shooty shooty, as I like to call them. Um, but the weapon oriented subclasses don't need dexterity or strength. They all get some way of using your intelligence as your attack and damage modifier for your weapon rolls. So that is actually really good. So intelligence, doesn't matter which subclass you're taking, intelligence is your most important statistic. And then you'll obviously want dexterity and constitution as per usual. Dexterity, 14 will do, you're wearing medium armor, it's capped out at a plus two bonus. Of course, if you're planning on taking medium armor mastery later on, maybe you do want that 16. Hey, who am I to stop you? Um, proficiencies then. No, first hit die maybe. The hit die for the Artificer is a D8. It's a respectable hit die. It's nothing super special, but it allows you to be on the front line if you want to and actually survive a punch. Then actual proficiencies, again, on the defensive side. You get medium armor, light armor, and shields. That's actually pretty good. Some of you might have seen like a medium armor ranger or fighter with a shield in action up front. They are risk respectably tanky and thus the Artificer is also respectably tanky but with a little bit less uh, hit points. Um, but don't be afraid to wade into the thick of battle. You do have medium armor, you can carry a shield, that is actually a lot of armor class uh, already. Weapon wise, you get simple weapons to start out with, that's okay, you, you'll get something to bunk or shoot people with at the start. Um, you might want to rely on cantrips more uh, for the first levels until you gain, if you're going for one of those in the thick of battle or weapon oriented subclasses, you might want to rely on cantrips first because probably your intelligence is going to be higher than your uh, dexterity. But I mean, go for it, do whatever you want. Uh, so that's weapons. Oh yeah, you get tools as well. You get thief tools, which makes you a decent addition to any party because you can pick locks, huzzah. You also get tinker tools because you're an artificer and any tool set that you might want, you can have as well. There's like a third one. Uh, mind you, you, all of the subclasses also give uh, tool proficiency. So your artificer is going to be swimming in those. I have a dwarf artificer and he has like five or six tool proficiencies right now. It's a bit ridiculous. Um, before we head over to saving throw, there's one more important weapon proficiency that I haven't talked about. It's 
kind of optional. It depends on your dungeon master. But if your dungeon master allows uh, firearms into your campaign, the artificer is the only class that has this proficiency from the get-go. Other characters will have to take the gunner feat. The artificer does not. And he has options to circumvent the other issue that wielding a gun might offer. But more on that later. Uh, so you have the firearms proficiency if it's relevant in the campaign that you're playing. Good to know. Now we come to the saving throws and these are good to great even. You get intelligence. This is your um, small saving throw. You know what I mean. It's like the lesser relevant one. But you get a constitution saving throw proficiency. And that is amazing because you have a lot of great concentration spells. You're a battlefield controller slash buffer slash debuffer. Concentration is your best friend. So a constitution saving throw proficiency is even better. Hallelujah. You got it. Be very happy with that um, because you will have spells on your list that really want to stay up. You all know what spell I'm talking When I talk about a spell that really wants to stay up when you cast it, you know there's haste on the class list and you know you want to keep that up. Um, what else do you get at level 1? An ability called Magical Tinkering, which allows you to imbue a few non-magical objects to allow them to perform one of... Uh, three or four little things. They can give out uh, a smell, a non-verbal sound, a spoken message of six seconds long, uh, a static visual effect, or uh, what was it? Oh yeah, light, a little bit of light. You can have as many of these up and running equal to your intelligence modifier. So these can be great to set out like bait and distractions, I think, in, in caves or scenarios where you're being chased. They don't have any real combat value. You have a little bit of light. It's really not a lot of light. It's like five feet uh, dim light, I think it is. Yeah, bright light. Five feet of bright light. Who's that? Um, so if all else fails you, you have a little light. But these are to test how creative you can be. And then we, of course, come to spell casting. Um, Intelligence-based spell casting, of course, as per usual. You also prepare spells, like the cleric, like the druid. At the start of the day, you get to go through your entire spell list up to the level that is available to you, and you can select whatever spells you want based on your artificer level, and your intelligence modifier also comes into factor here already to decide how many spells you can prepare. Uh, I'm going to say it once already, but the Artificer is, I think, the only class where I highly advise to max out your intelligence as soon as possible because so many of your class features are tied into your intelligence. Your spellcasting preparation for one, obviously also the strength of your spells, but if you go for one of the martial subclasses, the power of your weapons will also be intelligence-based and a few other features as well. So intelligence is really important. Get it up to 18 at least. 20 would be nice. How do you cast your spells? Well, you can cast spells through a focus as always, but your focus, your spell casting focus, are your tools. Your thief tools, your artisan tools, uh, whatever you have, those are the things that you use to cast spells. Or when you get your infusions, which are magical items that you can create yourself, those can also be your spell casting focus. And this can be really important. I think especially for the martial classes. Um, so if you have this martial oriented artificer and he's in the thick of battle swinging a warhammer, you can use the, and the warhammer has been infused with magic by you, you can use the warhammer as your spell casting focus, which um, stops you from having to fiddle around to touch a tool or get something out. It eases the spell casting uh, quite a bit for the artificer actually. Um, you only go up to fifth level spells. I should mention this. You're like the paladin, you are like the ranger, you go up to 5th level spells. No 6 to 9 for you, why not? You will be pooping out magic items by the end of your um, adventure and to kind of balance that out because it is a big big power that you bring to the table. Um, you only get up to 5th level spells, but there's some really good stuff on your spell list. Uh, but you're going to unlock them at a slower pace and you won't get as high. But don't worry, you will compensate. Uh, you start out with two cantrips. Uh, and that's a very little amount of cantrips, actually. For the first levels, I advise you to take a utility cantrip 
and an offensive cantrip. Uh, depending on how close you want to get, you could take Shocking Grasp or a more ranged oriented uh, cantrip. And whatever utility cantrip you want, you are a utility class, you'll find nice choices there. I do believe you have Guidance. Yeah, you have Guidance as an Artificer, if I'm not mistaken, which is always a great choice for cantrips. The good news is that every level, you can swap out one of your cantrips because it takes a hell of a long time for the Artificer to gain a new cantrip. It is only at third, no, at 10th level rather, that you gain your third cantrip, which is a long time away. So you'll have to make do with those two cantrips. Depending on which subclass you're taking, you might want to swap out your damaging cantrip for another utility cantrip if you're going to rely on weapons for damage, for example. That's an option. If you're going to be one of the more spellcasty um, artificer types, you will always need a damaging cantrip and probably preferable a ranged one. So two cantrips only, make them count but it, because it takes you nine more levels to get a third cantrip. And you do get a fourth, um, a fourth one, but that is at level 14 and that is the top. You get four cantrips in total and it's all the way up to level 14 before you get that fourth one. So yeah, that's rough. Um, you obviously prepare a bunch of spells based on your intelligence and your artificer level. Um, some good level one choices could be uh, Fairy Fire, Cure Wounds, Grease and Federal Fall. I know I always say that Cure Wounds is worse than Healing Word and to me it is, but you don't have Healing words on your base spell casting list. There is one subclass that gets it if I'm not mistaken, but the base artificer only has Cure Wounds. So uh, Fairy Fire, Cure Wounds, Grease and Federal Fall, fall are all... <laughs> becoming difficult to speak today, are all really great options. You could obviously swap in one of your damaging spells. You have a few, just not that much. Um, your base spellist is not made for blasting, it's made for supporting. If you want to blast, your artillery subclass will be your friend, uh, along with the few spells that you get here. So that is your um, main stuff for level 1, and that will want us to move on to level Two. Level 2 gives you the ability artificers are best known for, and that is the infusion ability. At level 2, you will notice, depending on how many books you have, you have an enormous list of stuff you can make. Magical items you can make. Huzzah! Every dungeon master hates you now, but the party is going to love you. Alas, they are not permanent. What you basically do is you take a non-magical item and you infuse it with your technological prowess. You make this better. You tinker with the item to make it better. And then you can keep it for yourself or you can give it to one of your party members. Your infusions can be active on anyone, basically. Uh, rule technical, at the end of a long rest, you get to decide which infusions you turn on and off for the day. Because at level 2, you learn 4 infusions, but only two can be on at any given point. Uh, this, of course, increases over the levels. I'm going to give you a quick uh, rundown here. At level six, it becomes six known with three active. At level 10, eight known, four active. At level 14, 10 known, five active. And it caps out on level 18 with 12 known and six active. Some of these require attunement. And obviously you start out with only three attunement slots, so whoopsie. Um, but a lot of them are great. I'll give you a few examples of what's in there. There's some very generic but good stuff in there. You can turn any weapon into a magical plus one weapon or any armor or shield into a magical plus one armor or shield. The great news about these two infusions is that when you reach level 10, they both automatically transform in plus two weapons and armor. Already pretty strong. Does that mean I can provide my entire party with plus one weapons at the start? No, you can only have each infusion up and running once. So you can buff one person's weapon and one person's armor. Other options are, um, I don't know actually, I forgot, damn it. No, there's other stuff. There's uh, the return, repeating weapon, for example, which is really interesting for people who want to shoot with crossbows or with guns. You get to ignore the loading property uh, and ammunition gets created automatically and it gives a plus one modifier to your weapon, which really means that now your crossbow can actually benefit from the extra attack feature, which is great because some artificer, one artificer gets it and maybe somebody else in the class wants it as well and it doesn't want to rely on crossbow mastery or whatever. That's some good stuff there. 
as I said, I'm not going to go through the entire damned list. There's not just weapons and armor, though. You also get the wonderful ability to replicate a set of well-known magical items. I don't know if it's on level 2, but I because throughout the game, each time your limit goes up, you also gain access to a new batch of magical items to create. So a new tier of items to create, except for the level 18 one. You don't get, like, level 18 magic items, but up to 16 or whatever the, the latest bump was before that, you do get access to new tiers of magical items. You can recreate stuff like Bag of Holding, Cloak of Protection, Ring of Protection, um, uh, what, Alchemy Jug, everybody loves that one, who doesn't want to create mayonnaise on command. I would love to talk about all options, but there's too many. Just understand that this is where the Artificer's customizational potential comes from. Because really, whatever core magic item you need to make some build work, chances are that the Artificer can provide it to you, to, to yourself, or to a fellow party member. I'm not the greediest of artificers, so usually at I'm still at the lower tiers of play. I only have uh, three infusions up and running. Um, it's more than two. And I have two of myself and one on one of my allies. Simple as that. But the more you get, the more you can hand out, or the more you can robocop yourself and become some beast of destruction with six magical items. Apart from whatever loot you might be finding, uh, during the campaign. So some of these items are also really utility based. They're like stuff to allow you to walk on water, stuff that gives you advantage on certain ability checks uh, or, or skill checks rather. You can get dark vision, um, more protection, more protection, more protection. There's like this relatively silly build that easily allows an artificer to get up to 25 armor class on their own using their infusions. Uh, and I don't, don't even think they're using a big feat. Now one feat. Um, so there's a lot of potential here. Go through the list. Imagine your artificer. See what you need and see what your party might need um, for them to function. I might do a separate video on the infusions, but honestly, it's too much to talk about. Level three is your subclass feature. Time, well, you select your subclass, you will get stuff on 5th, 9th and 15th level for your subclass. Lots of fun, there's four options, they're very varied and they each bring something to the table. Num uh, level three also gives you the ability called the right tool for the job. Uh, a niche ability, but can be really useful if you have an hour of time to spare, and this can be during a long or a short rest, so it can be part of a rest, actually. You can create any set of tools as long as you have your thief tools or your artisan tools. With those and an hour of time, you can create any set of tools that you um, need at that point. And they remain until they um, are until the ability is used again. And while the tools are created by magic, they are non-magical. So your magic technology creates the tools, but they are not considered a magical item. Which means you can infuse them, technically speaking. If there's something you can do to your tools to infuse them, there would be an option. Um, so basically you can summon any set of tools. Which is great because you'll have proficiency in so many things. But usually artificers don't have a very high strength score. So dragging around all the tool sets without automatically making a bag of holding and carrying it out medium armor, maybe even a shield, is going to put a heavy load on your carrying capacity. So this is a great way to alleviate some weight out of your backpack without automatically having to spend an infusion slot on bag of holding to keep all the stuff you have safely and somewhere uh, accessible. Then, of course, we have the levels 4, 8, 12, 16 and 19, which are ability score increases. We just scoot past those. Bump your intelligence. That's all I can say. It's it's really important. Um, so five of the subclass level six is tool expertise. Um, but we're first going back to five. Aha! I almost forgot because that's also the level where you get uh, level two spells. And I went through the list again. I'm going to give you some good utility options. Well, there's one damaging option here as well, but a few utility options, and there is more by now you have your subclass and each of the artificer subclass also gives you some uh, pre-prepared spells like the cleric uh, subclasses do um, so there's going to be some relevant spells for you always prepared to supplement your own list um, 
But from the Artificer list level 2 spells that are good are obviously Enhance Ability is a very flexible spell to allow you to buff somebody's ability scores very decently. Enlarge Reduce, I love Enlarge Reduce, it's great utility, also has combat purpose. Put it on your fighter and let him go and have fun. Uh, heat Metal is always good. By Jove, I, I cannot stress if your enemy is wearing anything metally, this is a good spell. Either you make them drop their weapon or keep a hold of it and they burn all the time, or you just enchant their armor and you make them cook. Uh, it doesn't... Okay, the great thing about heat metal is that there is no save involved. You just touch the metal and it becomes warm, like hot cooking, boils people alive, hot. Uh, kind of like my, like my attic at this point, which might be why my speech is going shbrr. Um The one downside is, is that it's a concentration spell. The good news is you have a constitution proficiency. Yay, for your saving throw, so go. So, um, enhance ability, enlarge, reduce, heat metal, invisibility is here as well. If you want to be the exploring artificer, invisibility, hop hop. And web. A lot of these are concentration spells, so... Pick wisely, of course, but Web is a great spell to restrain a bunch of enemies to give yourself and other people more whacking potential. So that's also really, really good. Um, so that was level 5, level 6, tool expertise. Basically, any tool check you do has expertise, kind of, so you get to double your proficiency bonus. And then, once again, we come to one of those abilities for which uh, maxing out your intelligence is relatively important. It is Flash of Genius. Um, when somebody within 30 feet, yeah, 30 feet of you makes an ability check or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to the roll. And that's good. Uh, the only problem I have is it doesn't clearly state whether it's before or after the roll. It doesn't state, so talk about that with your DM. Um, it doesn't say anywhere that you cannot do it afterwards. They have to make the roll, it says. So they make the check, you see the check, and then you can react and add your intelligence modifier. So one, the higher your intelligence, the better this ability is going to be. Adding a plus five to any roll as a reaction, any roll, any uh, ability or saving throw, mainly saving throws here, is really good. And you can also do this a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier per long rest. So if you have 16 intelligence, you can hand out three plus three buffs to saving throw or an ability check. But if you have 20 intelligence, you can hand five plus five buffs per day as a reaction to the same rolls. So that it's really good. I love this ability, it's a great support ability, it's another ability that clearly says the Artificer base kit is very supporty, um, but it's very strong. Uh, then level 8 is of course uh, more subclass, no, uh, ability score, and level 9 is more subclass stuff, but don't forget level 9 is also when we get our level 3 uh, spells. I've already mentioned that haste is on our list, haste is going to be good because you have that constitution save proficiency. Um, if you're one of the martial classes, and it, haste works for everyone, let's be honest, but if you're one of the punchy punchy classes, you'll enjoy it because it's another attack. If you're a spellcaster, you can cast another spell, or you can cast it on someone else and keep concentration because you're really good at keeping concentration. Um, so haste, catnap, if you have a party that gains a lot from short rest, I'm thinking of fighters and rogues uh, in first uh, case here. Uh, catnap can be a really valuable spell. It allows um, up to three people to gain the effects of a short rest with only 10 minutes, but they're asleep. That's the deal. So some classes can gain a lot of this. A uh, fighter almost fully resets on, on short rest. Same for a warlock, almost full reset. Wizards can regain some spell slots. There's a lot of benefit to be had here if you don't have the time for a full, full rest. Like the DM says, oh no, you only have 15 minutes. Okay, catnap. <laughs> Uh, and you stand guard, obviously, because you don't gain a lot from short rests as an artificer. Um, and so you can keep your party member safe, or at least kick him awake if something happens. And Revivify is also there. You can, if, if you're short on healers in your party and nobody has any revive -y spells yet, Revivify is going to be a good friend for you there. Obviously supplemented by whatever um, 
class uh, subclass spells you get. Then we get to Magic Item Adept at level 10. Um, I said, yeah, there's quite a few attunement stuff in the item infusion list, and that's true. And you only have three attunement slots. Enter Magic Item Adept, which gives you a fourth attunement slot. No other class has this capability. You are the only class who has four attunement slots. And on top of that, if you craft an actual magic item with rarity common or uncommon, so not the rare ones, not the blue and the purple and the legendary ones, but if you, if you make like a basic or a green magic item, it takes you a quarter of normal time and only half as much gold. Now this is very dungeon master dependent again. Um, it might be that your dungeon master doesn't want to allow you to craft magic items. And also it's really a bit meta gamey to go like, okay, this magic item is not on my infusion list or I can't replicate this magic item. I'll just craft it. No, personally, me as a dungeon master, I would rule that you could make any of your infusions, like the green or the common ones, obviously. So low level infusions, permanent. Uh, and then at the next level up, you could swap out that infusion for something else, or at the next long rest, you can deactivate that infusion because you now have the item permanently and you can activate something else. That's how I would rule it. Or maybe if you find a spell scroll that kind of replicates uh, an effect that also is on a magic item, maybe I could allow you to make that item. Something stupid, if you have a spell scroll for, or you know the spell magic weapon, artificers have the spell magic weapon to make any weapon into a plus one, maybe you could say, see, I know the spell, I also have smith tools, uh, can't I make a plus one? It's an uncommon, uh, uncommon magic sword. Sure, but it would take some time. Talk about this with your dungeon master, because this is... Um, it's special. I mean, there's not a lot of classes who can make magic items and you're pooping them out already at 100 kilometers per hour. And this just adds to that. So talk about the system with your dungeon master. Do try to encourage them. And here's me encouraging you dungeon masters to allow your artificers to make something. They don't have to make a staff of power. They don't have to make a deck of many things. Allow them to make something useful. All right, level 11, uh, 11, another fun feature, you get the spell storing item. After any long rest, you can touch a simple or martial weapon or anything you can use as a spell casting focus and you can infuse it with one of your first or level spells. Any person holding this thing can take an action to cast the spell. By the way, the spell infused has to have the casting time of one action. Uh, so that means you cannot infuse it with um, Absorb Elements, for example, which would be great to give to anyone, um, but you can't because it's a reaction-based spell. So any action-based spell can be infused, first or second level, and the person holding the weapon can use the weapon to cast this spell again as an action, using your spellcasting ability. So if you're dumb as a rock fighter, wants to cast, let's say, web, he's using your spell save DC, not his. Thank bejeebus for that one. Um, the spell can be cast an amount of times equal to twice your intelligence modifier. Again, we see the importance of a very high intelligence score come into play here. Not only is somebody else using your spell casting modifier, but they can also cast the spell a number of times equal to your intelligence time too. So a uh, 20 int artificer grants 10 castings of a certain spell to anyone else in the party. Um, and I didn't say this, but yeah, infusions, you can't infuse something that's already magical, but this one, does allow you to do that. So for example, you have your friendly fighter in the party and by now you've infused this weapon into some glorious plus two beat stick of death. You can further infuse, well it's not infusing, you can store let's say enlarge reduce in his sword as well and now the fighter can cast enlarge reduce on themselves and they're also keeping concentration themselves. That's right, using this unless you're casting the spell for some reason does not use up your concentration. So it allows the fighter to buff himself and then you can cast haste on the fighter, making one glorious ball of death to send your enemies away. This is actually pretty good. Of course, the amount of spells are limited. 
the base artificer list has some and some of your subclass spells will also be um, up for this because the moment you gain them through your subclass they count as artificer spells for you so um, you could put some low level blasting spells sure but there's some healing or some utility spells combat control I, I said web web with a really good example for this one having the fighter concentrate on web he can web his enemies himself and then whack on it you could web some more enemies or haste the fighter see it opens up a bit of um spell casting concentration stuff by allowing ideally a non-magical uh, character to cast some spells which is really good level 12 ability score increase on we go level 13 you gain access to your fourth level spells you don't get any fancy class features but fourth level spells i'll just um, i talked about creating a robot army um in the intro so uh summon construct is here uh you could also take fabricate which is a very artificery spell to be able to create things out of uh, thin air basically there's other good stuff there i'm just Picking out some uh, artificery themed spells, really. Uh, we move on to level 14. Now, you were already a magic item uh, adept. Now, you become a magic item savant. Yes, your proficiency increases with magic items. You now have five attunement slots. And you ignore basically all requirements there are to using a magic item. So class race, spell and level requirements stuck to any magic item. You can wave those away. The rogue, some, uh, the thief, I think, has a similar ability. Um, and it's really great on paper. The one issue there might be that you have to convince the other party members that you're better off using this item. And it's not just because you can use it, there also has to be a reason why you should be using it. But I don't know the infusion list by heart. Maybe in the infusion list there's some stuff with restrictions, but I don't think so to be honest. But if there are, you can now use it anyway. The most important thing is five attunement slots here. Um, and we're not done yet at all. Um, level 15 is another uh, subclass feature, 16 in the NAS, and 17 is your fifth spellcasting level. You finally capped out spellcasting, Hosea, fifth level, has some good spells. My two personal favorites here would be Animate Objects, I've used that spell to great effect. Um, your robot army is in full swing if you cast Animate Object, by the way, it's a great spell. And you also have access to greater restoration. Don't forget, your spell list is mainly very supporty. Even if you take a very offensive subclass, don't forget you still have access to those great um, support spells like greater restoration. Um, so that's level 17. 18 caps off, caps off your uh, attunement party by making you a magic item master and now being able to attune to six items that is double the amount of items any other character can have and at this point of course we're level 18 that caps out your infusions as well you have six attunement slots and you can infuse six magical items hmm i wonder if this was done on purpose you can as always with infusions you can hand them out to your friends you can go put them all on yourself you have a lot of options you are a master of anything that is a magical item we're not done yet though of course level 19 ability score increase but level 20 um artificers actually have what is in my opinion one of the better capstones out there at level 20. obviously you have the barbarian one which is amazing but this one is really strong as well so it's called soul of artifice and the first thing which is the most important one and amazing really is that you gain plus one to each of your saving throws for each item you are attuned to now dear people you can attune to six items if you do that which should not be too hard in between actually finding some loot in the campaign and creating a bunch of items yourself you have a potential of having a plus six to all of your saving throws in the hypothetical case that there is a paladin in your party and there are eyes doing their work, you can go all the way up to plus 11 on each saving throw, uh, plus your flash of genius to help out other... Oh, man, it's ridiculous. Your saving throws are ridiculous at this point. But that's not it. Um, if you would be reduced to zero hit point but not instantly killed, you, as a reaction, end one of your infusions to drop to one hit point instead of zero. Now, this is uh, a failsafe. Um, 
and you won't want to use it all the time because dropping an infusion also drops you in power, especially now that your saving throws are depending on those things. Um, but it might be very vital if you know that your turn is next, for example. It could be very vital to just stay alive, have your turn, do something amazing and then continue your life with your one hit point. <laughs> and there we are, ladies and gentlemen. That is everything I have to talk about for the Artificer. I've touched upon some spells, I've touched very lightly on the infusions, but let me state again that they are super important. Um, but the amount of choice that you have is too large to talk about in one video, really. Uh, the Artificer, again, is super flexible thanks to the subclasses, the infusions, the spells, and whatever else you can get a, get your hands on. Um, go play one and tell me about your artificers. Let me know in the comments down below how they've been doing. And if all goes well, dear people, I will see you again in two weeks in the Attic Dungeon.